I feel like according to the what you mentioned about the king and the boomer, I think that's just like a it, it's just it, it just is this way now at this point. Oh, you, know? you just it, accepted it. Okay. I am yeah, I mean I just accepted <laughs> okay. it because I, I don't en- I, I enjoy these memes. I enjoy being, you know, mean for my spears, I enjoy being mean for being such a veteran player for playing a long time. And I still think people do actually appreciate me and I still think people think I'm good, but of course, um I would say ninety five percent of my streaming as well that I've been doing for God knows how many years now, I think probably like ten ten, eight years. Uh, I also meme a lot. I joke a lot. So I feel like it's it's quite normal. I also don't have hard feelings for LEC for calling me a boomer. I think that uh, it was a good joke. Of course, it's more like painful for some of the fans now that I'm playing in Heretics because we don't do as well. Sure. If I'm in G2 and we are winning, of course, or my, any other team and we are winning, everyone would be like, haha, this old boomer is like, yes. you know, old and, and he's still playing. But... Now that I'm in Heretics and we are not doing as well, then when people meet me, oh no, he should still be appreciated. He's still good at the game. So I feel like the difference is only how good you are at the game and people wouldn't actually mind it. I've heard when he came back in summer, there was even some mad thing where the only way he was allowed to come back was he had to be like in a different room or like an apartment or something. He wasn't even with the other four players. Yeah, You would that, scrim happened, and yeah. then you <laughs> managed to qualify for Worlds and somehow at Worlds, I was told, dude, even before the semi-final, like, mate, we could basically win Worlds and this team's never played again with these five players next year. Like, it's just a one-off last thing. Thing sort of. So give me that story because to, to, if a fan doesn't know it, they would always think if you make like a big placing, everyone must like get along or it must be like, sounds like a very weird setup. It sounds like one of the weirdest setups ever. The player's not even in the room. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think basically uh, I was very like convinced that I want to play with a different AD carry back then, right? I wanted to like stick with Freeze, but the problem is that Freeze had issues with hand. Yes. So she kind of performed very poorly as well. And our org decided that it was mainly, I think, H2K's decision that like, the only way we make it to worse is with Forgiven because he can actually like play better than Freeze right now. So then they brought up brought back Forgiven, but yeah, the idea was he plays from a different room in a different apartment. <laughs> Basically in a different apartment. So sure. he was playing from a different apartment. So then when we reviewed the games, he was like not part of it. We would just review as four people, we would try to learn concepts as four people, and we kinda expected him to like just auto attack. And that's good because he was good at auto-attacking. He was good at, like, you know, sidestepping, at uh, maximizing damage output, and then whatever he would die or not. I mean, that was just, like, a different story. But he, the deal was that he wouldn't, like, make comments in game as much. And, you know, the, the reviews would be without him. So then he had time to, like, chill out, right? And then somehow we made it to Worlds. Um, and then I think we went, like, one and three or something. I don't remember, like, the first week of Worlds. I think it was four teams or so. But I just remember we lost, like most of the games and then we hated each other like not like all of us hated each other but like the atmosphere in the team was terrible like we it was just awful and then somehow we you know made quarters and then in quarters we had one of the worst teams at worlds True. making quarters so we got lucky and then we made semis that being said that team did beat i think g2 esports back then right yeah. which were the strongest european team yeah. so it's not like they were like bad in bo1 oh, no. but like i i couldn't imagine ourselves losing to them so then we trio them and then um yeah, well, we made semis, and then the story would. It was uh, it was the first zero three uh, yes. in my professional career uh, at the international stage. There were like a couple of zero threes. All right, after, sure. But... <laughs> sure. <laughs> but that was yeah the first yes. zero three. Right. When you have that sort of a team, did that uh, was that actually a flaw to the team? Like, like, do you believe, for example, I mean, you've been through now many different organizations. Do you think that people should have like a very harsh? Uh, mentality when it comes to like if a player seems like he's dropped off his motivation isn't there or whatever should you remove a player immediately when it's like that do you have a philosophy on that from your experiences yeah from my experiences it's definitely better to kick them faster than to worry about kicking somebody too fast i guess right. like i think the the only time the, literally we, we kicked like 20 people probably off clg no, like 10 10 20 people the only time i felt like we kicked somebody off way too fast and without giving them a, a second chance was Voiboy. 
Like I really felt like Boy Boy had a ton of potential as a player, and we—I yeah. don't even remember why we kicked him. I feel like we only kicked him because Hotshot was so hot to play top, lane top lane again. again. Yeah, you want, you want like, that was the most funny. messed up thing ever. He wasn't even bad. Like, oh no, this is what's good is that you don't realize that because, like you're saying now, like you feel like it was a mistake. There's actually a detail from the grill that I did with Voy Boy, which at the time Voy Boy said in his interview, because obviously this is after he'd been kicked from CLD like a year later or something, you know. He even mm -hmm. says in this interview like because he's obviously he's complaining like you know what i wasn't that bad like i need to be kicked off the team <laughs> and he he said some detail right along the lines of like what like what's bizarre is that they kicked me off the team and then the same day double have told me i'm the best top player in north america so then he's just like what the fuck like, I'm the best. like <laughs> so it makes it sound even worse than it but i get the context now the the point obviously is it wasn't necessarily your choice to kick him and so yeah. maybe you just said that to you know kind of be like hey keep your head up or something yeah, no, I really I liked Boy Boy a lot. He was he joined. He was this happy. He still is happy go lucky dude. You know, really, really earnestly positive guy. Probably a mistake to join CLG. Then. Terrible <laughs> environment. The worst environment for him. I think we just tore him down as a human being. Like we just we ripped his soul. The summer split obviously had its own fuckery because it was the whole Korean boot camp and then everything falling apart. But I always yeah. tell people this. Like people wait actually who are fans wait too long to give you and Afro credit as a bottling. They wait until CLG wins the LCS basically to finally be like, see, oh, I guess they are a good bottling. I always tell people just because CLG was failing as a team and in the playoffs, that, that bottling was pretty much amazing from like season four on, right? I mean, that was the era when that was half the problem with Seraph, right? Is that the bottling was sick, but then if everyone else feeds away in the top lane and then Link fucks up something in the mid lane, then you can't win the game with one lane. So... In a, in, a, in a weird sense, I don't want to make excuses for you, but I can understand where the frustrations would come from if you're in a team like that. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was, it was pretty rough. I feel like there's a lot of resentment, not only because like we were the, I feel like we were the best part of the team and like we kind of knew it, but like we were also the most popular part of the team because like right, Seraph right. and Link didn't have very many fans. So I, I think like it's all these like little tiny things that always make like a big difference. Like, when we have fan meets, you know, and people, they don't even know who like Seraph and Link are. Like they just like barely know their names or something, but they like spend like a minute t like gushing about me and Afro. I'm like, oh, I watch your streams all the time. You guys are so funny together. It's like, I feel, I don't know. I, and then people the time, are doing that shit where they're it, like, it's actually kind of fucked up. No, that's the sort of scenario, right? Where someone comes up to Seraph and he's thinking like, oh, finally, they're going to recognize me. And they're like, hey, could you take a picture of me and Doublelift together? And then it's like, that's like the worst <laughs> yeah. feeling obviously yeah. in the world, isn't it? Like if you're, the, if you're actually a pro player. <laughs> I will say back then, I think he was one of the first players I ever saw where he was almost like loved as much as he was hated. Like the people who loved him would be like, but why don't you win more? Which is like, that already sounds like a hater comic, guys. <laughs> and then the haters were obviously just like, anytime he loses, like you just fucking overrated. Like you shit, you don't know how to play. That Protoss was better. By the way, the ultimate insult is probably the last one. That's the joke I would throw in there. But basically, give me some thoughts on now, all these years later, who was Idra? Because I mean, the way he exited StarCraft, sadly, that wasn't really the way he should have gone out, you know. I would it would have been cool if he'd gone out on top and it had been like a respectful mm. send-off. Like he's someone in the West would be in a Hall of Fame in RTS, but I feel like the way he went out, like people just remember the drama and they think he was never a good player or something, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's sad the way he went out, but like I mean, I've known Idra for ever. Uh like I used to run the best uh North American team and uh in in Brood War called Micromedia, and he was actually brought to me. Um, when he was like not known and, you know, a, a mutual friend who was also on the team skew brought him and he's like, this guy's really good. Let's play him some. So, let's see. So I played him and he just fit in perfectly with us. He was an angry Terran player, which is basically what we all were. Right. Because <laughs> Terran is such a pain in the ass in brood war, but, uh, he just kind of fit in really well. And yeah, he had that kind of temper. This is something that like happens a lot. Uh, this is it's like a meme at this point about like uh, playing Terran uh, in Starcraft one, because it's like if anything goes wrong at all, you lose anything like you have to basically play flawlessly. And if you can do that, you can win championships. But it's like ridiculously hard to do. So he had this mentality that not a lot of people have. It's like the most unplayed race at this point uh, in Starcraft. But you know, it, it, that's that's the type of mindset, right, that you kind of have as as one of those players. And, you know, I've, I'm known as a salty player. He was known as a salty player. And as you know, he, he worked really, really hard and became the best non-Korean Brood War player for a good chunk of time in there. You know, he got so popular and so big uh, at the beginning there that and to watch like like you said, anytime anything goes wrong. 
everyone is all over him. Like I remember there was this hilarious short period in in the beginning of Wings of Liberty where like literally if you beat Hydra all like in a online cup or something, you'd get signed to a team immediately. This actually happened. I remember watching this and be like, I can't believe that this terrible guy that just all in Hydra just got signed to a team the next day. Like, that's insane. And then, of course, these guys would disappear because they actually are trash. It's just people are like, well, he beat Hydra. He must be really good. Uh, but yeah, when, when you're watching all of this happen and people are shit talking you because you're kind of an emotional, angry player, uh, I think that that, you know, he he definitely was like kind of a villain of sorts, right? Where... A lot of people like to have, you know, are fans of people that like they're they aren't doing anything villainous. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to describe it exactly, right? But but Idra was very. Uh, I mean, they cheered against him, with, right? They wanted him to lose. Yeah, yeah. Well, when he loses, it's more fun in a lot of ways right, because he yes. actually will say something. True. Like a lot of people that are nice with. Like, remember Liquid Hero? Like, he loses, he just kind of gets sad. And yes. it's like, oh, man, I like really feel you can see the tears in his eyes. Like, he lost. He really means a lot to him. Well, it meant a lot to Hydra, too. It's just he showed it in a different way. He showed it by flicking off MC or whatever, right? Like, that's, <laughs> you know, he he showed that different type of emotion. And it's funny because, it, like, the dividing the scene like that into, like, haters and big-time fans, that's, like, the most powerful thing you can do, I think. And that's something that is, like, really missing uh, when you look at at most esports nowadays, yes. especially as esports get older and like you get more and more people that have just quietly grinded for 10 years that are pros now, you don't get these types of personalities anymore, but they are like the biggest things for the game. What does your dad think then of, of the whole being able to get a career out of being a commentator and getting to do, I mean, like uh, this is an example of where to someone else, if they don't know the background, might not mean much. But I assume since you guys are so into hockey, et cetera, like that doing that MLG Columbus must have been sick for him, right? When you were in that was, Jackets Arena and you know, Nationwide Arena that they play in, et cetera. Yeah, that was the first. So you met my my father actually and my mother there. That was the first event that like they came to that I I got them there and said like you guys need to see this. And that was like the perfect event to bring them to because dad was like completely enamored with it. He was like, this is amazing. Like the whole arena is so loud. That my dad's a big tech guy. Like he used to do a lot of like uh, uh, like music setups and stuff, like running big projectors and speakers. So he was like looking at the stage, like holy shit, that stage is insane. Um, and he was he was loving it early on with dad, it was, it was interesting because dad's very ambitious business wise. And he was like, I also played a lot of sports. So for two reasons, he was like, why are you in your room? Are you making any money? Like, what are you doing? Um, and I used to like close myself off completely. It'd be like a beautiful summer day. Like my friends would call and be like, let's go hang out somewhere. And I'd be like, nah, I'm just gonna play games. Like, and it was like, they used to pass for my internet and stuff. And, um, I, once I moved away, I went to university, I played a lot more on my own, obviously, and they couldn't control that. But even still, I was doing a lot of commentary and dad didn't understand it. And he was like, oh, whatever. Like, even though he was a commentator, he was like, are you making money? Can you make money? I did two a ESEA lands where they literally paid for my plane ticket. And both times I lost money being there. Okay. And even like, whatever <laughs> else. I was just typical ESEA at the time. Um, and both times he was like, well, that's, that's not, you shouldn't be doing it if you're not making any money. And then when I did X Games... Uh, I told him I was going and I was getting paid and everything was great. And uh, he was like, okay, that's cool. And then at the end of the event, I had a bunch of texts being like, good job, good job, good job. And then I had one text from my dad being like, your voice sounds like shit. We need to work on your breathing. And I was like, okay, that's the moment. That's it. Dad's on board. But he's into that's, it though, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's okay. dad. That was dad's way of saying, all right, we need to work on this. What role do you actually think talent plays in becoming a commentator? Like, do you do you think there really could be a guy who's just very, you know, obviously he can't be terrible, but he's just a very plain. He's very just like a five out of 10 in every category. If that guy had the right mindset or the right mentorship or he studied enough, could that guy become a top caster? Do you think you have to have some something in it? Um, yeah, do you mean of the current, like sort of younger talent that want to get in? There's someone that could this break This is a through, general like concept for casting in general. Okay. Uh, I mean, yeah. If you want to lead off to like the to the to the, yeah. There's obviously politics and stuff that can hold some people back. I think talent will always get noticed. So, like, if you are very natural, you. The other thing I will say is a lot of young talent make a mistake where they compete with their co-caster. Like, why? It's not Formula One. You don't have to beat your teammate because he's the only one in the same machinery. It's it's you're both better off if you have good chemistry. 
And that was something that like I realized really early, like don't ever compete with them. There's no point. You're just making your boat yourself, like both of you look bad. So yeah, as long as you're like super workable, um, you have good chemistry, you're genuinely into it, like talent will get noticed. But I still think that like, you can be a 10 out of 10 out of talent and you won't make it to the top necessarily because there's a lot of other background personality things. Like you've got to get along with the people you're working with. We spend a lot of time on the road together. You know, you've got to, you've got to be someone who's sociable. I think the social aspect and social dynamic is super important in the Counter-Strike casting scene because we tend to, more than other games I've seen, go out a little more for dinner or drinks or whatever and party. And um, that's kind of part of our dynamic in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, I think I think if like, if, if you're asking like how much does raw talent help, it's definitely going to get you started, but it's not going to get you all the way to the top. One other thing was during this time, just before you got Carrigan, was when you had all those tournaments. Where, like I say, the playoffs never happened, but the most the epic one, because it was just like, if you remember, this was ESL Cologne, where you got the group of death, where oh, the group yeah. was like, SK Gaming, best team in the world. G2, who's just fucking beating SK Gaming and won like a LAN. Fanatic, <laughs> yeah, Fanatic, like with all, all the fights. And then your team, and it's like, mate, and look, but remember, only two teams are getting out of this group. Because yeah. one thing I even remember about this, right, this is what I wanted to ask you about, was famously, when you guys, like in the BO1, I think you beat Fanatic or upset yeah, them or did, some did, shit. Did, yeah. So when you did that, right, because it meant that, like, logically, like, I think G2 and Fnatic, one of them, like, couldn't get out at this point or something. I did some, like, edgy tweet that was like, oh, thanks, Faze, for fucking up the whole group, you know. Because my whole thing was like, you're not going to do anything in the playoffs. And I remember Rain just, like, replied and was just like, fuck you or something, right? <laughs> and what's mad is, at the time, I thought, like, oh, maybe Faze is actually, they think they're going to do it. Okay, they're getting a bit cocky. And then, obviously, you guys didn't make it. So, but then I saw you at the event, and it's like, mate, you look like someone shot your dog or something. So I was thinking, like, what was going through everyone's heads at this time? Like, did you, did the team actually really believe, like, we can actually do it we can get out of this group was it like oh no. fuck we'll try i guess <laughs> oh that was that was pain when we got the group 100 percent. you know you wait for cologne every year and then you get that fucking group but you got it you gotta say it you gotta say that you believe you gotta you know try to fool yourself that you believe but looking back i don't think we were fucking believing that we could get out of that group of course winning the best of one gave if i don't remember wrong it's like win one best of one you win one more best of one you're fucking out of the group yes win, you know yeah so and the loser match or the elimination match was best of three Yep. Or was it, yeah. So winning the first match definitely gave us a chance. You know, all you need to do is just deliver one more good best of one. But I don't think we really believe that, you know, we could we could get out of that group. Um, I, I think that's just, you know, you put on a, a mask. I remember, I can't remember the specific match, but it was when I was at E-League. I think it was E-League season two when Carrigan just came in. I remember there was like a, a game... It could have been season one as well. It was one of the E-League tournaments for sure. Because I remember doing the actual, you know, when you do like after each map on the analyst desk. So the problem with that is naturally you end up doing, everything's a hot take, isn't it? The guy who top frags on one map. It's like, see, this is why he's a great player. And you did this, right? You had one game. I think it was like, I can't remember what map it was. You had one game where you popped off. You had like 27 kills or 30 kills. And so we we went on the desk and we obviously had to be like, this is why they kept him from clues. You know, they believed in him. And, I was, and then I think you know where the story's going. And then in the next map, I'm not joking, you might have had like three frags or something. It was like, holy shit, bloody hell. You know, it was one of those ones. Like, because that was what your game was like. It could just be mad up and down, right? It was fucking up and down. There was no consistency. I, I think I remember. I think it was Overpass versus C9 where I popped off. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was like elimination match or like a match to reach the playoffs or something like that. Or like win the group, but I can't remember it. And then I, I don't remember the, the, the three frags one, but it, I definitely had a couple of them in face. Sure. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, it, it was rough times. I think I also remember Dreamhack, Bucharesti or whatever. We played like a best of three versus, uh, I think it was Dignitas at the time. And we lost 2-0 and I had a total of nine frags in two maps. And I remember I had an eco ace where they rushed ramp. I had P90. Oh, that's right. even worse. You won those one round just half of that it. Was like over, that was legit over 50% of the frags. It was a fucking that's even ace. worse. <laughs> and I remember the fly of the plate back. I was like, "Holy shit! If I don't lose my job, then I don't know what I'm. I don't know. God is saving me, I guess." The Beatles said they get by with a little help from their friends, but I get by with a little help from my Patreon community. And this video was kindly supported by Matt Pugnaccio Rakula, Ahmed Haju, Bot Pounder 420, Toucan Animosity, Tobias Bernasconi, Jensen Gore, Tosh, and a special thanks always goes out to my main man, Jerky's Minion. Would you like to ask me a question in my monthly video AMA? Do you want teasers to find out who are the upcoming guests? Maybe you want to take part in one of those lengthy but intense esports discussions I have with my donators or maybe you want to suggest a guest or a topic that I could cover well if any of those 
tickle your fancy, put your money where your mouth is, and join the Skrilluminati today, where, in the description box below, there is a Patreon link.